while we have victims or survivors coming forward and saying, me too, we need men to say, I did that. Mm -hmm. We need men to step forward and to see themselves in these stories. And where are the men at this round table mm -hmm. that can come and, and, and contribute their voices as well? That was Teen Vogue Editor-in-Chief Elaine Welteroth, who you might remember from our panel last month on sexual harassment. Now we're speaking with a group of five accomplishments, all leaders in their fields, about how the Me Too movement is impacting them. Alex Wagner spoke to the group for nearly an hour, and the conversation could have lasted much longer. As you watch these stories unfold, every day there is a new story. There is a new Washington Post story, a New York Times story. There's a story on the Internet. I'm sure for a lot of men there's fear, right? Where are you guys as this all unfolds? Judd. It, it's certainly a, a tidal wave uh, that, that's happening. But I look at it like, isn't it amazing that so many people have felt the need to be silent for so long? How terrible must the environment be hmm. that right now, uh, as a result of the internet and as a result of just uh, uh, you know, a confluence of events, people feel safe speaking up? Just this week, Ken Friedman, Mario Batali, high-profile restaurateurs go down, and yet kitchens are places where this behavior has gone unchecked mm -hmm. for decades. Mm -hmm. So what's the answer here, Tom? I think, and you're right, it has been going on for decades, and, and I think the answer is, and I think we're seeing the answer, it's, there's a cultural shift happening right before our eyes right now, and that's where the struggle is. But until we take it a step further and say, what can we do in our industry to make sure those women not only are safe, but economically, there are, are structures in place that, that actually can, can, can see them thrive. Men are, are kind of grouped together for, from a very young age, and, and whether it's you know, athletic teams or um, in locker rooms or fraternities, where you're amongst a collective group of men, um, there becomes a uh, vernacular that is negative towards women, um, and there becomes uh, an expectation of other men to place um, ideology on conquering women. And Leland, I mean, that brings to the fore the question of sort of masculinity and how young men are indoctrinated at an early age. And you have written about this. You are a I'm a Me Too, yeah. and, and I was five years old. And these, you know, older kids decided that, hey, we're going to have fun with this young little boy. And, you know, I, I talk about this in my book because it's like, how can I help other kids get over this? Because so many kids that are abused, they end up, some are abusers themselves, or alcoholics, or just whatever happens to them after them, especially if they don't get help. Did you ask yourself those questions, though, about, you know, how could I, how could I have let this happen to me? I mean... Oh, I did. Yeah. I blame myself. I shouldn't have gone over there. I shouldn't have, I should have fought. I should have done something differently. And I think that's that part of the shame that builds in us that causes cancer in you, that if you don't get it out or have a vehicle to have someone to talk to. We talk about a lot of this aggression in the context of the victims, and one of the reasons we wanted to have men talk about this is because really, men are part of the solution, right? And yet, so much of this conversation is among and for women. What is that about, Prabhu? I don't think men are the solution. I really don't think so. I think, th I think there needs to be a shift in a thinking of like uh, treating women as a weaker sex, that they need to be protected somehow. I'm very fortunate enough to be surrounded by extremely strong women in my life, you know, who've, who don't put up with any of these kind of stuff. And, you know, um, so I think a man's role becomes a lot about listening. Let me listen to women, not just white women, women of color, mm -hmm. trans women, all women across. Judd, you are surrounded by women at home. Mm -hmm. What has it been like to be in your house at this moment? I mean, I have a lot of emotions about it. I feel, you know, a lot of sorrow for my daughters to have face a world that is uh, often dangerous. And for a very long time, you know, we, we talked about, you know, how do you stay safe? And also expecting young men, boys, to be respectful. Like, what do you, what do you want from relationships? What do you want uh, from these interactions? You, you want to be treated well. And if people don't treat you well, they should not be in your world in any way. And I think that too often, um, uh, men, especially when they're around women, what they're really concerned about is being humiliated in front of women. And that's where a lot of this starts. Um, and so trying to teach them that, that 
you know, a, a girl in your class is as strong and is smart, and and that's okay. That shouldn't humiliate you. You don't you don't have to be better than everybody. When you talk about a woman's perspective, Mark, you're wife is a victim of abuse mm -hmm. and was silent about it for a very long time. What did she teach you about the issue? My wife uh, had you know, domestic violence in her house um, when, she was, when she was younger um, and she really didn't share it for, for many years um, until she you know, felt comfortable around a man for the first time, which was with me. Um, and it was interesting, at that time, in my life, I was diagnosed with bone cancer and I was going through uh, radiation and chemotherapy. My future was looking pretty bad. And when she felt comfortable enough to, um, to tell me about uh, the violence that had occurred to her, it, it, was, it was interesting how all those things didn't matter anymore. It didn't matter how I looked or how I felt. I felt more like a man in that moment because it was creating a safe environment for uh, another human. What should happen to the men who have been accused of sexual predation and harassment. Should you be allowed to have your career back? I'm least interested in what is going to happen to these men. What I'm interested in is how are we going to empower women? How are we going to change the conversation? You know, the Louis C.K.'s of the world may not work again because we know him. The idea of him actually going out there and doing something, I think, is going to be rejected by society. But what about, what about, what about that, that, that chef who's working at some third-rate hotel in Nebraska somewhere who sexually harassed women, gets outed, he'll just move to another town and no one's gonna know his face. And he'll get a job. So to some degree, this is a conversation about who has power and how power is wielded. Yeah. And who it's has about, power that doesn't do anything. Yeah. You know, Harvey Weinstein is writing checks to people. Right. Bill Cosby's right. writing checks to people. Right. And because he's still making a lot of money, that the, the powerful people, they're just saying, eh, this is too much of a pain in the ass for me to become the person to shut it down. Right. It's a culture change, it's a movement. And you know, the Civil Rights Movement didn't end when we signed the Voters' Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act. It, it's, it's still continuing. And so I think this is culturally present right now, and I think it's something that we're focused on now, but this is gonna take generations to actually fix. Alex Wagner joins us now on the set. I love the fact that we have included men in this conversation, yeah. Yeah. right? Because this is as much about power dynamics as it is about how we raise men, boys to men, the inter interrelations of the sexes, yeah. how we interact with each other. So tell me, what stood out to you? Well, one of the things that, first of all, a lot of men want to talk about this, right? I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the conversation has centered on women, but of course, as you point out, Emory, this is a conversation about women and men. And men are often also the victims of sexual predation. Right. We can't discount that. But as far as it concerns this group of men, all of whom have seen a lot of harassment in their own industries, they want to talk about it, they want to be part of the solution, and in a way, I think a lot of them feel empowered to do more to help victims. That part of it was really, really, really positive. Mm -hmm. There seems to be kind of a, there are some men that were complicit and say, you know what, okay, I was guilty of doing such and such over the years. It's made them do a little self-reflection. There's some men like the ones you talked about that were like, you know what, I now want to stand up too because I'm a little ticked off of what I've seen that's taken place over the well, years. Maybe I should have said yeah, something. Yeah, and I and think that's, they feel there's an expectation for them to do something and say something. I think they understand that the landscape has changed dramatically. The vocabulary around sexual harassment harassment has changed, the expectations have changed, and I think there's almost an excitement to try and combat something that they all secretly have known was really wrong for a really long time. In listening to these men, have you gotten a sense from the interviews that you've done that there is this ground, this groundswell of now support where People like Judd, who were on movie sets, and he's been in the comedy, the, you know, the, the stand-up, uh, you, you know, scene for so many years. Well, now, you know what? Rather than sit back and watch something happen, stand up and say something. Or Tom in the kitchen, maybe the sous chef now sees one of the chefs mishandling someone, and will step up and say something. Yeah, and I think, but I would say, I think pointing it out and sort of chastising bad actors is part of it, but they're all looking to sort of frame this in terms of broader institutional change, which is why all of them were saying, you know, yes, this is about getting the sexual harassers out of the kitchen, mm -hmm. out of the, off the set, but this is fundamentally about empowering women, this is about equal pay, this is about a host of other broader reforms that will ensure institutionally that this never happens again. Can we listen to something that uh, Tom Colicchio said and then we'll talk about it? Just play that a little bit. The big guys are gonna fall down. And the rest of us are going to you know, stand here picking up the pieces to try to figure out really how we make progress. This is the beginning of it. It's, we're seeing the, the, the monuments fall right now. 
I kept going, I, that clip was so powerful yeah. that we're seeing the monuments yeah. fall. And I think we're seeing, you know, we have, had, we have a lot of socio-cultural debates happening in this country right now. This is on par, if not greater, than a lot of them, right? Yeah. This yeah. is a huge moment of seismic change. And I think you can't underestimate, of course it's a huge moment for women, for victims, but it's also a huge moment for men in yeah. terms of how they conceive of their own masculinity. And to your point, how young men, how boys become young men, become men, mm -hmm. and what we teach them about the dynamics of power and gender. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you know one of the conversations that's happening more and more is that one of the things that we do with boys is limit the way in which they can express themselves emotionally mm -hmm. that that if it's a negative emotion it is it is expressed in anger whether it's shame whether it's sadness and what ends what you end up is with is men who can't express them, themselves yeah. emotionally and that's sort of it's becoming a big broad thing right there but I think one of the things that I got from this conversation too is that you know we've been talking about how men have to stand up but it's difficult for a man to stand up against a Harvey Weinstein, too. Yeah. Because he was just so popular, or not so popular, sorry, so powerful yeah, sure. that he could ruin a man's um, a career as well. Yeah, well, and <clears throat> Judd Apatow talks about the environment, the people that sort of serve around these predators. Some of them don't want to do anything because, as, as Judd says, and I'm paraphrasing, it's a pain in the butt to do anything. You don't want to have to be the person that stands up and says, I'm going to take you on, right? Yeah. Part of it, and Judd has said this as well, is greed. You know, Harvey Weinstein sat atop uh, a, an empire that was incredibly lucrative for a lot of people. Dismantling that means someone somewhere is going to lose a lot of money. Um, and then the third piece, to you, as you point out, Anne-Marie, is it's hard to raise your hand sometimes. Mm -hmm. It is, and it is hard for men to come out against other men sometimes. That was the point that I was trying to make, is you need the soldiers to actually get in line. In order to take down the one at the top, yeah. you need some of the other players that are complicit, that are watching this stuff happen, step up. And it needs to be just more, not just one, it needs to be, you know, a number. You know, the, before we let you go, Mark Herzlich of the New York Giants, it, yeah. was, it was good to, to, to see him from an athlete's perspective. Yeah. I remember, you know, I was a sportscaster when I broke in 25 years ago. At that time, women in the locker room was like, no, it was, it was taboo. Yeah. And it was the part of that movement where it was first starting to happen, and it caused a major controversy. And now it's commonplace. There are so many female reporters out there in locker rooms covering football, baseball, basketball. It's it's part of that cultural change you're talking about. It took a while, but now it's you doing Well, you yeah, and Mark is, has uh, learned a lot from his wife, who was yeah. a vict victim of domestic abuse. Um, and he's he's on the front lines, as it yeah. were. You know, he said there is a power dynamic even in the locker room. There are really well paid star quarterbacks, and then there is the rest of the totem pole. Yeah. And sometimes it is difficult to confront the most powerful guys in the locker room when they're exhibiting bad behavior. But he's willing to do it. And yeah. like you, as you said, Chris, that's where it starts. Yeah. It's about movement from the ground up. Yeah. No doubt, it's really compelling stuff. Really good, Alex. It was Thank great you. to that. Great to do it. Great that CBS yeah. wanted to do it. Yeah.